Martin Luther King Jr., one of the, if not the, most renowned and popular figures of the US civil rights movement. Martin went from being a young minister from Georgia to a global figure who fought against the socioeconomic injustices that stem from the deep-rooted issues of racism and segregation in America. Martin Luther King's life and work were so important in the 1960s for the movement fighting for social justice and desegregation that they live on today and are still relevant in the current social climate. But who exactly was he? This is the Loud Girl Talks History Podcast and this is the life of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr. was born on the 15th of January 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia, the middle child of the King family. His father, Martin Luther King Sr., known by many as Daddy King, was a pastor at the local church, Ebenezer Baptist Church, and was quite influential in the local black community. Daddy King had a formidable personality. He was charismatic, strong-willed, and many people would say to Martin, I'm scared to death of your dad because he wasn't afraid to tell it how it was. He was always honest and lived by his really strong moral and religious principles. Meanwhile, Martin's mother, Alberta, was also a deeply religious person. Martin described her as a soft-spoken, easygoing and warm person. When he was born, apparently the doctor said that Martin was physically the perfect child and he said himself that he was never really sick. According to Martin, he had a relatively happy home life. His parents were extremely loving and supportive. He knew that he could always turn to them if he needed any help. Religion was also a really important aspect of the King family life. Martin went to church from five years old and from then on went every Sunday. He was taught in a fundamentalist church, i.e. they interpreted the Bible in very literal terms. However, two major events happened in Martin's childhood that would have a profound influence on him. First of all, when Martin was 12, his grandmother passed away and this really affected Martin because his grandmother was really dear to him and he always had a sneaking suspicion that he was his grandmother's favourite grandchild. As a result, the passing of his grandmother really strengthened Martin's belief in the idea of personal immortality. Secondly, when Martin was about six, he invited a white childhood friend that he had had since they were three to play. They had recently started schools that were separate, but that didn't really bother Martin. He was shocked and hurt then that his childhood friend said, no, I'm not allowed to play with you anymore because my dad said so. At the dinner table that evening, Martin asked his parents why his friend wouldn't play with him anymore. And it was at this point that Martin's parents had to talk to him about the system of racism and segregation that ran deep in America. Because by the time that Martin was born in 1929, it had only been 64 years since slavery was abolished in the United States. In its place, though, were Jim Crow laws, which enforced racial segregation in public establishments. Schools, restaurants, public bathrooms, swimming pools and parks were separated to be used by either blacks or whites. Black passengers and white passengers were also separated when they used public transport, such as buses and trains. Within these Jim Crow laws was the principle of separate but equal, and this was used in the US Supreme Court case of Plessy v Ferguson. Homer Plessy boarded a train with a first class ticket in the white only section but he was an eighth black and the conductor told him that he had to move to the car near the back of the train that was for black passengers. He was considered black purely because he had any kind of black heritage and so he had to move. However, Plessy refused to move from the white only section having paid a first class ticket and was subsequently arrested. This issue was taken all the way to the US Supreme Court, where Homer Plessy argued that segregation was unconstitutional because the US Constitution said that all American citizens had to be treated equally in its 14th Amendment. The court ruled that segregation wasn't illegal and the races could be separate as long as they were treated equally. In fact, segregation was anything but equal. Public bathrooms that had the white only section would have a normal bathroom and then there'd be a very clear difference in quality in the facilities that would be provided for the blacks only section. In public buses, the front of the bus was reserved for whites only. Even if there were no white passengers on the bus, black passengers were not allowed to sit in whites only seats. Black passengers would get in at the front of the bus to pay for their ticket but have to go back out again 
enter through the back entrance of the bus and then board. Then, before they could enter through the back entrance, the bus would have sped off and the black passenger would be standing at the bus stop with the ticket they had paid for and not be able to use the service that they had been charged. Learning about the intense racism in the US and the fact that this racist structure robbed Martin of his childhood friend really hurt him. He was determined to hate white people and would hate white people as he grew older. Martin's parents though would tell him that it was his Christian duty to love everyone, even those who hated him. Above all, Martin's parents instilled in all of their children a sense of self-respect and self-worth. Alberta taught her children that they were as good as anyone, even if society treated them like they were less than. Daddy King was a lot more outspoken than Alberta. When Martin was young, they were shopping for shoes and they were told by the sales assistant that they had to go to the back of the store if they wanted to be served. Daddy King said, no, we're fine as we are. But the sales assistant said, sorry, you're just going to have to move. To which Daddy King said, we're either going to buy the shoes sitting right here or we're going to leave. And he and Martin left the store instantly. Daddy King was just not going to tolerate being treated less than simply because of his race. And he said as he was leaving the store, I don't care how long I have to live with this system, I will never accept it. And he didn't. Daddy King refused to use public buses after seeing black passengers being beaten. He was the president of the NAACP in Atlanta, a civil rights organisation which aimed to secure political, educational, social and economic equality in the US. Martin's role models, his parents being examples of and teaching him never to tolerate the unequal systems around him, would be the perfect home environment that would foster Martin's own future and career as a minister and civil rights leader. From his childhood, Martin showed himself to have quite the promise for public speaking. In April 1944, when he was 15, Martin won a public speaking competition where the subject was the Negro and the Constitution. In one section of his speech, he said the following, We cannot have an enlightened democracy with one great group living in ignorance. We cannot have a healthy nation with one-tenth of the people ill-nourished, sick, harbouring germs of disease which recognise no colour lines obey no Jim Crow laws. On the way back from the competition though, Martin and his teacher were on the bus back home when some white passengers got on. The driver told them to move so that the white passengers could sit in their place and when Martin and his teacher didn't move quickly enough, the driver started swearing at them and so they had to stand 90 miles until they got to Atlanta and Martin said it was the angriest I had ever been in my life. That wasn't the only time that Martin saw racist behaviour enacted in front of his eyes. He witnessed police brutality, members of the Ku Klux Klan beating black people and saw black people who had been lynched. Martin also wanted to be different from the stereotype that white people had of black people being late, loud and messy. He wanted to go against this stereotype as much as he could and he ended up earning the nickname Tweed at high school for his sharp dress sense overdressing and wearing full-on tweed suits with cufflinks and freshly polished shoes to school. That same year, Martin enrolled at Morehouse College to read sociology. Martin's father and grandfather had gone to Morehouse as well, so he was the third generation to go. That summer before he started college, Martin worked on a tobacco farm in Connecticut and he found Connecticut very different to Georgia. In Connecticut, black people didn't have to use segregated water fountains. He could eat at restaurants with his friends and white diners would be sitting on the table next to him. Martin wrote to his father while he was at Connecticut and said, There was no discrimination at all. The white people here are very nice. We go to any place we want to and sit anywhere we want to. So it was even more difficult for Martin to return to Georgia after his summer in Connecticut and return to Georgia where he had to go back to the segregated system in Atlanta. He would ride on the train from New York to Washington, where he could sit wherever he liked, but then had to move to the Blacks-only car for the rest of his journey back to Atlanta. Martin was very young to be going to college at 15, having skipped the 9th and 12th grades, but even though he was now a college student, Martin only had the reading ability of an 8th grader, so the average 13-year-old. 
However, Martin soon caught up and became a voracious reader. He was particularly inspired by Henry David Thoreau and his essay on civil disobedience. And Martin later reflected from his essay that he became convinced that non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. And that Thoreau's writings and experiences really came alive in the civil rights movement that Martin went on to lead. At Morehouse College, Martin loved higher education. He found it as a sort of safe place where his classmates and professors were willing and excited to talk about the issues of race and social justice that he was also passionate about. Martin joined organisations which were passionate about securing racial justice, including an intercollegiate council which had members from different colleges and races. Throughout a lot of his childhood, Martin had been determined to hate the white man, but he found that there were also white people who were just as committed to the cause of racial justice as he was. So it was during his college years that Martin found that black people and white people could work together to enact racial justice rather than working in opposition against one another. It was also during college that Martin had a period of doubt regarding his religion and Christian faith. He felt like there were huge contradictions between what he had learned at Sunday school and what his professors were teaching him at college. And Martin was grappling with the age old debate of science versus religion. How can you still be religious when scientific theories and findings based on concrete evidence appears to really refute fundamentalist religious teachings. Martin also struggled with the way that the black Christian community expressed their faith with shouting and stamping, I didn't understand it and it embarrassed me. Martin was really pondering on the idea of reconciling Christianity with modernity to a point where religion could be considered intellectually respectable as well as emotionally satisfying. It was two professors at Morehouse that would really influence Martin's conclusions on the science-religion debate, Dr Mays, the president of Morehouse College, and one of Martin's greatest influences, and Dr George Kelsey, a professor of philosophy and religion. Dr Mays and Dr Kelsey were Christian ministers, but Martin also saw them as really intelligent, educated men as well. So Dr Mays and Dr Kelsey were figures that Martin saw as religious, but also intellectual people. Martin was really inspired by the doctors and looked towards them as role models for the kind of minister he wanted to be. In Martin's senior year at Morehouse, Martin felt a really strong urge to enter into the ministry. He had felt this urge since high school, but now more than ever, he really felt this powerful sense of responsibility that the ministry would be his calling. So Martin graduated Morehouse College with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology in June 1948. And on the 14th of September, he started a Bachelor of Divinity degree at Crozer Theological Seminary, a school that was designed to prepare students to enter into religious positions. At Crozer, Martin read Plato, Aristotle, John Locke, Karl Marx and many other writers and if anybody's read them, they are such difficult reads and you need so much concentration, I can't do it. But anyway, Martin almost completely rejects the idea of communists that was forwarded by Karl Marx, saying that it was basically evil because Marxism views the individual as subject to the state, where his personal rights or freedoms were of less importance to the state. But Martin believed that it should be the state that is subject to the individual and that morals should be of key importance to society. Martin did acknowledge, though, that communism grew as a protest against the hardships of the underprivileged, something that Martin deeply cared about. From reading Marx, Martin did heighten his concern about social issues regarding wealth disparity, saying that capitalism is always in danger of inspiring men to be more concerned about making a living than making a life. We're prone to judge success by the index of our salaries or the size of our automobiles, rather than the quality of our service and relationship to humanity. And this reflection remains so relevant to today's culture of hustle mentality and the tendency for people to measure their self-worth by how much money they have or how much stuff they own rather than have I made a meaningful connection? Do I have strong relationships with the people that I care about? 
So Martin came to the conclusion that Marxism wasn't the answer to social problems, but neither was traditional capitalism. So Martin was wrestling with this conundrum of what practical solutions would be the most effective to answer the social issues of the day. Martin's answer would be found at a sermon that was delivered by Dr Mordecai Johnson in 1950, a pastor who was lecturing on the life and teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, an activist in India. Martin was so moved by this lecture and Gandhi's principle of non-violent resistance that as soon as he left the lecture, Martin got all of the books that he could get on Gandhi and was inspired to read more deeply into his life and teachings. Martin said, Gandhi was probably the first person in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social force on a large scale. Love for Gandhi was a potent instrument for social and collective transformation. It was in this Gandhian emphasis on love and non-violence that I discovered the method for social reform that I had been seeking. Much of Martin's college years were spent studying and reading. And in a letter to his mother, he said, You stated that my letters aren't newsy enough. I never go anywhere much in these books. But in the next paragraph, he says, Do you know the girl I used to date at Spelman, Gloria Roster? She's in school at Temple and I've been to see her twice. Also, I met a fine chick in Filler who has gone wild over the old boy. Since Barbara told the members of his church that my family was rich, the girls are running me down. Of course, I never think of them. I'm too busy studying. And it's at this point that I have to say, I think Martin's lying in this letter. He definitely made time for the ladies. But in any case, Martin also started to become engaged with the more liberal interpretation of Christianity and this allowed him to reconcile his religious faith with scientific and intellectual study. Being passionate about his religious faith and intellectual pursuits, when Martin graduated Crozer on the 8th of May 1951, he started at Boston University School of Theology in September 1951 to start his PhD. At Boston, Martin had further opportunities to speak to advocates of nonviolence, where he became convinced that nonviolent resistance was one of the most powerful tools that oppressed people could use to attain social justice. In Boston, Martin also met his future wife, Coretta Scott, who was a singer at the time. He said that he had met some girls in Boston, but none of them were really wifey material, except for Coretta. Martin said that he was literally just about to give up on finding himself a life partner when he asked his friend Mary Powell to link him up with any friends that she knew, so she introduced Martin and Coretta to each other. Their first date was over the phone, where Martin said, I've heard some good things about you from our mutual friend Mary and I'd love to meet up sometime. They talked a bit longer and Martin said, how smooth is this? You know, every Napoleon has his Waterloo. I'm like Napoleon. I'm at my Waterloo and I'm on my knees. I'd like to meet you and talk some more. And Coretta agreed that she would meet with Martin and he'd pick her up in his green Chevy. When they met up for the first time, Martin found that Coretta wasn't just a singer. She couldn't just talk about music. Coretta was interested in and could hold a conversation about issues of inequality and peace. Martin found that Coretta herself was actively involved in movements that aimed to further causes that championed peace and equality in America. For Coretta, when Martin pulled up in his green Chevy, she was a little surprised to find that Martin was shorter than she'd thought, and in terms of his height, he seemed more like a boy than a man. But the more that Martin and Coretta spoke, Coretta found that Martin was really charming and charismatic. It was when Martin was speaking that he grew in stature, and Coretta knew that he was a really special person. And Martin must have been very impressed by Coretta, because he said... You have everything I've ever wanted in a wife. There are only four things and you have them all. Coretta asked, how can you say that? She was really shocked at how blunt and honest he was. Martin replied, I can tell. The four things I'm looking for are character, intelligence, personality and beauty. And you have them all. When can I see you again? And on the 18th of June, 1953, Martin and Coretta were married in Marion, Alabama, Coretta's hometown, and it was Daddy King who performed the marriage ceremony. Afterwards, Martin and Coretta spent the night at a funeral parlour because there weren't any hotels for black guests with a bridal suite. And this was looked on with some fondness by Martin. He would say to Coretta, Honey, do you remember when we spent our honeymoon at a funeral parlour? 
Martin and Coretta's marriage was a largely happy one as well. Amidst everything and the future of civil rights and chaos that Martin and Coretta would experience, Martin knew that he could always look to Coretta as a person who would be there for him. Their marriage was a partnership. Martin said, I'm convinced that if I had not had a wife with the fortitude, strength and calmness of Corrie, I could not have withstood the ordeals and tension surrounding the movement. In his final years at Boston University, Martin had to decide what career path he wanted to take. He liked academia and three colleges offered him various posts. He was also approached by churches who said that they would be interested in having Martin in as a pastor. One church in Montgomery, Alabama, called Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, sent Martin a letter to say that they had an opening and invited him to preach there for the day. So, in January 1954, Martin drove into Montgomery and was not only wowed by the physical beauty of the town, but also the history behind it. Martin was really nervous on the night before he was due to speak, which was on the three dimensions of a complete life, but he had worried for nothing because it was really well received by the audience when he delivered it the next day. The pulpit committee went to Martin, if we offered you the job, how likely would you be to accept it? And Martin said he would give such an offer a lot of deep, considered thought. So he was keeping his cards quite close to his chest. But a month later, Martin received a letter to say that he had been called to the pastorate of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and Martin accepted. He did have a lot on his plate though. Martin still had to finish his PhD thesis and be a full-time pastor. For the rest of the year, Martin commuted between Boston and Montgomery to fulfil both of his obligations. Life in Montgomery was also quite the change from Boston. Montgomery, Alabama was in the South, where segregation and racial injustice were particularly strong. And in Montgomery, Martin had quite the daily routine. He'd wake up at 5.30am, write his thesis for three hours, then fulfil his duties as a pastor, and then spend the last three hours of his day writing his thesis again. Once a week, Martin would visit members of the church who physically couldn't go into church and pray with them. On October the 31st, 1954, Martin was officially installed at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church with Daddy King delivering the installation sermon, bringing about 100 people with him. Martin said that it was a great success and it was a huge milestone moment for him, a memory that he would cherish for the rest of his life. Not only was Martin's career starting, but his family was as well. On the 17th of November 1955, Martin and Caressa welcomed into the world their first child, a baby girl named Yolanda Denise, weighing in at a whopping £9.11, and they would nickname her Yoki. As a pastor though, Martin encouraged his fellow church members to register to vote and become a member of the NAACP. He also organised a church committee on social and political action, which worked to ensure that everyone was kept informed of the current affairs at the time. In his sermons, Martin would talk about issues of racial inequality in his sermons, and he went to monthly meetings of the NAACP and came to learn of the racial injustice that would play out in judicial decisions in the American courts. Not only was Martin involved with the NAACP, he also started working with the Alabama Council on Human Relations, an interracial organisation which put an emphasis on education in order to further human relations in Alabama and secure equal opportunities for everyone. Martin felt that this was key because it was an interracial organisation where both the black and white communities could communicate with each other and after a few months, Martin was elected as the council's vice president. However, Martin's involvement with both the NAACP and the Alabama Council drew a fair bit of criticism. The NAACP believed that social justice could be achieved by legal reform and the courts, whereas the Alabama Council favoured education as a way to realise social justice. People thought that Martin's participation with both groups was a little contradictory because of the different ways in which the two groups thought would be best to achieve social equality. Martin took a different view though. Through education, we seek to change attitudes and internal feelings. Through legislation and court orders, we seek to regulate behaviour. So for Martin, there are multiple different approaches and avenues that we can explore and use at the same time in order to support the cause of civil rights. As opposed to them being oppositional, these two methods could really work to complement each other. In the same year, 
On the 1st of December 1955, a 42-year-old black woman by the name of Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to obey segregation laws in Montgomery. Rosa was sitting in the blacks-only section of the bus when she was told to give up her seat for a white passenger. She refused and ended up being arrested by police. The next day, Edgar Daniel Nixon, who had signed Rosa Parks' bond and was a leading member of the Montgomery branch of the NAACP, phoned Martin and told him what had happened to Rosa. Martin listened with shock, and when Edgar said, look, I think it's time to boycott the buses to show how black people aren't going to tolerate this unfair treatment anymore, Martin agreed. So now they needed to come up with a plan. Martin Edgar and another minister called Ralph Abernathy were on the phone for half an hour to decide exactly how to go about the boycott. Edgar said that they should call a meeting of all the local leaders that evening and Martin offered Dexter Avenue Baptist Church as the venue. At Dexter, the leaders agreed that the bus boycott would commence on Monday, December the 5th, the same day that Rosa Parks' trial was set. They agreed on the following statement to deliver to the black community. Don't ride the buses to work to town, to school, or any place Monday, December 5th. Another Negro woman has been arrested and put in jail because she refused to give up her bus seat. Don't ride the buses to work, to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. If you work, take a cab or share a ride or walk. Come to a mass meeting Monday at 7pm at the Holt Street Baptist Church for further instruction. The next morning, thousands of these leaflets carrying this message were printed and distributed amongst the black community in Montgomery. Martin would later reflect that our concern would not be to put the bus company out of business, but to put justice in business. Through the black community's withdrawal of their support from the bus company through the boycott, they were refusing to participate in and tolerate a system where black people had to suffer social and racial injustices when trying to do something as simple as board a bus on their daily commute. Martin also viewed the bus boycott as an expression of Thoreau's writings on non-violent resistance that he had read all those years ago at university. So, it was Monday morning on the 5th of December 1955. The day of the protest had come. Martin and Coretta had woken up earlier than usual and were ready for the day by 5.30am. There was a bus stop just outside Martin and Coretta's house and they could see it from their front window. All they had to do now was wait for the first bus of the day to arrive. That bus was on a line which would normally be packed with black passengers and it was the most populated line for black passengers in Montgomery. Martin and Coretta agreed that if there was a 60% turnout for the bus boycott, they would see it as a success. And if all went according to plan, there would be just a handful of black passengers that Martin and Coretta would see that day. Martin was in his kitchen, drinking his morning coffee, when Coretta shouted, Martin, Martin, come quickly. Martin rushed to the front window and saw the bus completely empty. The second bus, empty. The third bus, empty, except for two white passengers. Martin then got in his car, started driving around Montgomery to see how populated the buses were, and there were barely any. Almost everyone in the black community had participated. People were walking, hitchhiking, riding mules or using a horse-drawn buggy. Even if a commute was 12 miles long, people would rather walk than use the bus for this very cause. Martin then went to Rosa Parks' trial, where she was found guilty of disobeying Alabama's segregation laws and was fined $14 in total, which Rosa decided to appeal. Reverend Roy Bennett, who was the one to suggest that the boycott would start on the same day as Rosa Parks' trial, invited people over to discuss what would happen at the scheduled meeting at Holt Street and where the boycott would go from here. Edgar Nixon, who was also there, said that he had been discussing with Roy Bennett and Ralph Abernathy that they should create some sort of organisation to lead the protest. Everyone thought that this was a great idea and Ralph put forward the name of the Montgomery Improvement Association, MIA. Then Rufus Lewis, a member of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, nominated Martin for president of the MIA, which was unanimously accepted. Before Martin could even process it all or even say anything, Martin had officially become the president of the MIA. After the meeting, Martin had just 20 minutes to write a speech that he would deliver at Holt Street. 
but he had writer's block. He didn't know what words and which ways he should go about delivering the most important speech of his life thus far to inspire the attendees of the meeting. Before he could really write anything substantial, Martin had to make his way to Holt Street. At the church, Martin found that there was a huge crowd of people filling the church and television cameras covering the meeting. And without much preparation or any notes, Martin made one of the most significant speeches he would make in his career. And Ralph Abernathy also spoke at the meeting where he gave a resolution of the demands that the leaders of the boycott wanted or they would continue not using the buses. The following demands were 1. Courteous treatment by bus operators 2. A first come first serve system of seating for passengers and 3. Black bus operators being employed on the bus routes which were predominantly used by black passengers. And when Ralph said all in favour of the motion stand, every single person in that church stood up and started cheering. As Martin returned home, he was filled with such a sense of excitement and hope that was just indescribable to him. You just had to be there. Martin would also say that that night was Montgomery's moment in history. A moment in history where black individuals were uniting in Montgomery for the common purpose of social and racial equality. As the president of the newly formed Montgomery Improvement Association, Martin sets about working out the various different departments and committees of the organisation, as well as making concrete plans to carry out and continue the bus boycott effectively. The first issue that came about was transportation. The bus boycotters would normally be taking the bus on their daily commute, and now they had to find other means of transportation in order to get to work. At first, the taxi company said that they would charge the boycotters the same fare as they would have been charged if they rode the public bus. However, there was a law that meant that taxi companies had to be paid a minimum amount that was higher than a standard bus fare, and so it was decided that it would be for the best if the taxi companies stopped participating in the protests. Martin decided to phone up Reverend Theodore Jemison, who had also led a bus boycott in Louisiana for advice. Reverend Theodore told Martin about this private carpool that had been set up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where volunteers would pick up the bus boycotters at certain stops around the city. And Martin decided to take inspiration and set up a carpool of his own in Montgomery. 300 people volunteered their cars to the private carpool enterprise and thousands of leaflets were distributed to let the bus boycotters know that they could take advantage of the carpool scheme. There were even white housewives who participated in the scheme, but it was more so because they refused their maids to be unable to work just because of some bus boycott. Martin was really proud of the fact that the guiding principle of the bus boycott movement was that of non-violent resistance. A white woman by the name of Juliet Hampton Morgan wrote a letter to the editor of the Montgomery Advertiser to liken the bus boycott movement with Gandhi's teachings. The Negroes of Montgomery seem to have taken a lesson from Gandhi and our own Thoreau, who influenced Gandhi. Their own task is greater than Gandhi's, however, for they have greater prejudice to overcome. One feels that history is being made in Montgomery these days, the most important in her career. It is hard to imagine a soul so dead, a heart so hard, a vision so blinded and provincial as not to be moved with admiration at the quiet dignity, discipline and dedication with which the Negroes have conducted their boycott. Unfortunately, she became a victim of abuse by members of the white community because of those letters. Juliet got hate mail, threatening phone calls, her window was broken and a cross was burnt on her yard. And sadly, Juliet committed suicide in 1957 at 43 years old, amidst the harassment and torment that she had to endure from members of her own community. 
As the bus boycott was entering into the weeks and months, the city and the bus company couldn't wait out any longer and opened up negotiations with the boycott leaders. Martin went with his colleagues to the city hall where he found that the city officials weren't really willing to accept any of the MIA's demands. So they ended the first round of negotiations not much better than before they'd started. Even after the meeting though, the bus boycott was still alive and strong in Montgomery. Now the city had started underhanded tactics in order to try and suppress the boycott movement. False rumours went around that Martin was using the money that had been raised for the boycott so that he could buy himself and his wife new cars. They also tried to go to the older members of the black community and said essentially, you are here first, you should be leading the movement. They even tried convincing other boycott members that Martin himself was the problem and they should overthrow him. In January 1956, the city suddenly announced that they had worked things out with a group of influential black ministers and had reached some kind of agreement. And this was the first that Martin had heard of this and he quickly found out who these supposed influential black ministers were. It turned out that the three people that the city had struck an agreement with were neither influential nor members of the MIA. So that night, Martin had to organise and let everyone know that no, the bus boycott is still on. And thankfully, the next day, the buses were still empty. However, Martin and the MIA were not out of the woods. On the 26th of January 1956, the Get Tough policy was announced. What culminated from the Get Tough policy was police officers arresting people for really minor traffic offences and this had the effect of people being scared that they'd lose their licence or car insurance and so they started dropping out of the carpool. What was worse, Martin was driving home one day with a friend and colleague but stopped off to pick some people up. As he pulled up, there were already policemen there who were questioning drivers and one of them recognised Martin and said, that's that damn king fellow. As Martin left the car park, he saw two policemen tailing him and his friend said, look, Martin, make sure that you follow every rule there is. So Martin took extra care to drive very carefully and very slowly. And when he stopped to drop the passengers off, a policeman said, get out, King, you're under arrest for speeding 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile zone. Martin was searched and put in the police car where they started driving towards the city jail. Soon enough, though, Martin was like, the police are driving in the opposite direction to the city jail. And understandably, he started panicking. If they weren't going to jail, where in the world were they going? Martin convinced himself that the police officers were going to drive him to a secluded place where he'd be jumped and beaten up. But after a while, Martin realised that he was, in fact, going to Montgomery City Jail. And looking back, Martin was so relieved that it was some time before I realised the irony of my position going to jail at that moment seemed like going to some safe haven. When he got there though, Ralph Abernathy came to Martin's rescue and paid a cash bond. And when people had learnt of Martin's arrest, they rushed to the city jail to see what was going on. As Martin left the city jail with his wife, he made a short statement and left, but it did mean a lot to him that people were there for him and supporting him by showing up at the city jail. Martin had barely any time to arrest after his arrest before more drama ensued. January 1956 was a very eventful month for Martin. Martin was at a mass meeting on the 30th of January 1956 and Coretta and Yoki were at home with Coretta's church friend, Mary Lucy Williams. Suddenly, Coretta heard a thump and something rolling and Coretta yelled, something's hit the house, run to the back. And Coretta, with Yoki in her arms and Mary, started making their way to the back of the house and a bomb exploded on the king's porch. It was the loudest sound that Coretta had ever heard. There were shards of broken glass and wood everywhere and smoke was just filling their lungs from the explosion, but they were thankfully mostly unharmed. It was actually other people who knew what had happened before Martin himself at the mass meeting. Martin remembered people struggling to break the news to him and eventually it was his best friend Ralph who told him what had happened. Weirdly enough, Martin's response was actually quite calm because a couple of nights before this, Martin couldn't sleep after he had received a particularly threatening phone call. These threatening phone calls and hate mail had become really common since the bus boycott but this one really stuck in his mind where the caller said, Before next week, you'll be sorry you ever came to Montgomery. Martin felt really emotionally weak and afraid of all the very real dangers to him and he started praying in his kitchen. It was then that Martin heard the voice of Jesus telling him to go on where it seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Martin Luther, 
Stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you, even until the end of the world. It was at that moment that Martin's fears and doubts just faded away, and it was with this strength that he had received through his religion that he was able to confidently face the bombing of his home, an event that would shake up almost every person. Martin returned home where things were getting out of control. Hundreds of angry people had gathered outside Martin's house where the police already were, and they were trying to move people along without much success. Martin also noticed that a lot of people were armed, and if tensions escalated up to a certain point, Point, these arms might very well be used. First of all, Martin checked that Caressa and Yoki were safe, and when he realised that Caressa was calm, that made him calm as well. The mayor, police commissioner, and some white reporters were inside Martin's house, uninvited, may I add, and they just didn't know what to do. It was up to Martin to take control, and he went to the crowd, calmed things down, and even when people had been incredibly violent to him and his family could have been killed, Martin still preached non-violence and urged people not to react with violence. From that night, Martin's loved ones tried to persuade him to get a bodyguard and armed watchman to protect him and his family. It was particularly hard for Martin's parents. When Martin visited his parents in Atlanta, where Coretta and Yoki were staying, he saw that his parents were really suffering emotionally from the danger that their son was in. They didn't fundamentally disagree with what Martin was doing, but they were scared for him and his safety. Daddy King, the formidable man who loads of people were scared of, couldn't talk about the protests without crying. Alberta was taken to bed after she heard of the bombing, and she subsequently suffered from ill health. Martin's parents tried to stop him from going back to Montgomery, but Martin knew that the bus boycott was for a greater cause and he had to return. Back in Montgomery, Martin did hire unarmed watchmen 24-7 and got floodlights for the house. He got rid of the one weapon he owned after speaking with Coretta, and it's really strange because getting rid of his weapon was more freeing emotionally for Martin than anything else. Knowing that he might very well die was something that he accepted, and Caressa was someone who Martin could always rely on for support and emotional encouragement, saying that in the darkest moments, she always brought the light of hope. Meanwhile, a legal case was being heard against the boycott. On the 21st of February 1956, the Montgomery Grand Jury ruled that the boycott leaders, including Martin, were in violation of the anti-boycott law in Alabama. Martin was found guilty of leading the boycott and had the choice of a $500 fine, which is about $4,700 in today's money, or 386 days of hard labour, but Martin decided to appeal the decision. Even though people were being arrested, even though the city was trying every method that they could to stop the boycott in its tracks, even though the KKK were trying to terrorise the black community, the protest was stronger than ever and would continue for months. The city also took legal action against the private carpool and on the 13th of November 1956, Judge Carter empowered the city to temporarily stop the private carpool. However, this decision was eclipsed by another important court decision that was also being delivered, but this time by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court declared that Alabama's bus segregation laws were indeed unconstitutional, and on the 20th of December 1956, an order arrived in Montgomery demanding bus integration. After over a year of the bus boycott, the protesting, the resilience and above all the non-violence from the movement, the Montgomery buses were now becoming integrated. Martin wanted to lead by example and he was the first black person to ride on the first integrated bus with three of his associates. At 5.55am on the 21st of December 1956, Martin boarded the first integrated bus. The bus driver smiled at him and said, I believe you're Reverend King, aren't you? When Martin said yes, the bus driver said, we're glad to have you this morning. And this marked the end of the Montgomery bus boycott. But this was not the end of the civil rights movement. On the 9th of January 1957, Martin and Ralph Abernathy went to Atlanta to meet with black leaders that he organised the next day. But in the middle of the night, they received a phone call to deliver the news that Ralph's home and church had been bombed that night. Martin and Ralph flew back to Montgomery to check that everything and everyone was okay, but Martin flew back to Atlanta that afternoon to at least show up to the meeting that he had organised. When he arrived at the meeting, Martin found that there were around 100 people who wanted to create a movement that would ensure that the Supreme Court's desegregation order was being upheld in the South, and they would do so through non-violent resistance. 
The movement was named the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC for short, and Martin became the president, holding the position until his death. Martin was also becoming a national figure as a leader of the civil rights movement in the US. In February 1957, Martin was featured on the cover of Time magazine for his leadership in the civil rights movement. Martin had become used to television cameras in his face and press coverage from his work in the civil rights protests. However, now Martin couldn't go anywhere without being recognised and so many people turned up to Martin's speeches that people had to be turned away from because there wasn't enough space at his venues. For instance in May 1957 a prayer pilgrimage for freedom was conducted in celebration of the third anniversary of the Supreme Court decision to outlaw segregation in public schools. This culminated in a two-hour service at the Lincoln Memorial, where around 25,000 black and white individuals gathered. The prayer pilgrimage also sought to appeal to Congress to pass a civil rights bill. At Lincoln Memorial, Martin delivered his Give Us the Ballot speech, where he spoke on the importance of African Americans being empowered with the right to vote. African Americans had to pass literacy tests, which would make it basically impossible for them to pass and be eligible to vote. When they went to register, the office would give out rubbish excuses saying that the office was closed, they didn't have forms, employees were at lunch or they were just simply too busy. Many black people just gave up registering to vote altogether because they knew that they wouldn't get registered. Later in the year though, SCLC launched the Crusade for Citizenship to push for the enforcement of African American voting rights through teaching and action. This campaign would teach Southern African Americans the importance of voting and the process of registering to vote. They also wanted to catch the attention of the Eisenhower administration and show how corrupt the voting system was against African Americans. On the 20th of September 1958, Martin was signing copies of his book about the Montgomery bus boycott called Stride Toward Freedom in Harlem, New York. Martin spent most of the book signing with his head down, signing, signing, and a woman eventually came up to him and asked, are you Dr King? And Martin said, yes. The woman said, I've been after you for five years. And then all of a sudden, Martin had been stabbed with a letter opener. The woman who had stabbed him was a Mrs. Isola Ware Curry, who would later be judged insane. Martin was rushed to Harlem Hospital and immediately taken to the operating theatre for surgery. The tip of the letter opener had been touching his aorta and his whole chest had to be opened so that they could get it out. One of the surgeons, Dr Maynard, said that if he had sneezed in the hours leading up to the surgery, the letter opener would have punctured his aorta and he'd have drowned in his own blood. I mean, thank God he didn't have hay fever. Anyways, Martin didn't sneeze, thankfully, and he recovered in hospital for the following days. Meanwhile, letters flooded in with well wishes for Martin, but one stuck in his mind the most. It read, Dear Dr King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. While it should not matter, I would like to mention that I am a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering, and I read that if you'd sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. After recovering, the doctors recommended that Martin not do any stressful or difficult work in the immediate future. So, Martin visited India, the country of one of his greatest influences, Mahatma Gandhi. Martin stayed in India for three weeks, spent time with the Indian Prime Minister and other leaders, and visited Gandhi's burial site. Even though he was told not to work, Martin did hold press conferences in India. But Martin loved his time in India and when he visited Cape Comorin, he called it one of the most beautiful places in the world. However, Martin also noticed the real poverty that was present in India, the caste system and Gandhi's peaceful protests against such a system, including the discrimination against the untouchables, the lowest caste class in the caste system. The caste system was something that, like Gandhi, Martin was strongly opposed to, and upon returning to the US, it became even more apparent to him that non-violent resistance was the most powerful tool that an oppressed people could use for justice, and he would continue this strategy in the American civil rights movement. In February 1960, Martin moved back to Atlanta with his family because that would be the best place for him to lead the civil rights campaigns of the SCLC. Around the same time of Martin's relocation, black students in North Carolina were protesting through sit-ins and other forms of peaceful demonstrations in response to the unfair treatment that they received at lunch counters. Only white people were allowed to sit on the stalls and booths and some black students were refused service. These black students said that they would stay at the counter until they were served and they remained there until the lunch counters closed. 
The next morning, 27 black students showed up again and refused to move until they'd been served. Four days later, this number of student protesters grew to 300. This became known as a sit-in, a popular form of protest by high school and college students. A new civil rights organisation was created, the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, SNCC, focusing on the discrimination at public facilities which in effect did not allow black people's presence there, such as libraries, parks and swimming pools. In response, these institutions closed rather than serve black people. And even though they were threatened with violence, police guns, tear gas and arrests, the students still carried out these sit-ins to protest the unfair and unequal service at the lunch counters. The SNCC invited Martin to join him in the protests, which he gladly accepted. At the sit-in, Martin was arrested with over 100 students and sent to jail. After five days in jail, the charges were dropped against the protesters and the mayor of Atlanta stated that they would work with the local businesses to end segregation in restaurants. However, as soon as Martin was released from jail, he was arrested yet again, but this time for driving with an Alabama license and not a Georgia license, which was considered a minor traffic offence. Martin had paid the fine, but police had put him on probation for about six months and Martin forgot all about it. Martin was arrested, taken back to jail and his legs were chained up and tied to something on the floor so that there'd be no way for him to escape. At the time, Coretta was pregnant with her and Martin's third child, Dexter, and when she heard that Martin had been arrested, she immediately phoned Senator John Kennedy for help, as Senator Kennedy had been in contact with Martin before. While Senator Kennedy couldn't help directly, he did enlist his brother Robert, who was New York Senator. Robert Kennedy rang the judge when he found out, basically saying, why can't he be bonded out? And Martin was released the very next day. Martin was grateful to the Kennedys for their assistance while he was in prison, but he also noticed that the Vice President of the United States, Richard Nixon, had effectively sat by and done nothing, even though Nixon and Martin would often speak and Nixon would get his advice on various matters. As soon as Martin was out of jail, it was back to business as usual. The SCLC threw their support behind the Freedom Riders movement, which involved seven black and six white protesters who would ride on buses from Washington DC to New Orleans. Throughout the journey, the black Freedom Riders would sit in the whites only sections and the white Freedom Riders would sit in the blacks only section. However, the journey was anything but smooth. A mob was waiting for them in Anniston, a town near Birmingham, Alabama, armed with weapons. The riders decided to stay on the bus than potentially be beaten and killed, but when the bus pulled in at the station, the bus's tyres were slashed. After restarting again, the bus eventually came to a stop and the mob, who had been tailing them, threw a bomb in the bus where it exploded and set the bus on fire. Thankfully, the Freedom Riders were able to flee from the bus, but when they got on another bus to resume their journey and the bus stopped at Birmingham, the mob once again attacked the riders. Martin, who had been following the situation, was furious that the riders had been subject to so much violence. Martin met them when the Freedom Riders arrived in Montgomery and held a rally at Ralph Abernathy's church in their honour. That evening, 1,200 people attended the rally where a mob outside started to set cars on fire and throw rocks at the windows, smashing the glass. Tear gas canisters were thrown into the church and a small unexploded bomb also landed next to one of Martin's colleagues. Realising the danger of the situation, Martin called Robert Kennedy, who was now the US Attorney General, for help. It wasn't until 4.30 in the morning for it to be safe enough for everyone to leave the church. As a result of the Freedom Riders movement, protests which became the Albany movement took place to demonstrate against segregation in public establishments. Martin was also jailed while protesting, but he refused to pay the fine, deciding on a policy of jail, no bail. Hundreds of protesters willingly went to jail in solidarity, choosing jail, no bail. Eventually, every protester was released and agreement was reached. But the protests restarted in July 1962 when the aforementioned agreement was reneged by the city. The Albany movement now invited the SCLC to join them. Within days though, Martin was in jail serving a 45-day sentence, having been found guilty for leading the December protest. In his diary, Martin wrote, This jail is by far the worst I've ever been in. It is a dingy, dirty hole with nothing suggestive of civilised society. The cells are saturated with filth, and what mattresses there are for the bunks are as hard as solid rocks and nasty as anything that one has ever seen. The companionship of roaches and ants is not at all unusual. 
Martin was supposed to be working on the streets as part of his sentence, but the chief decided that this was a bad idea. And rather than this being relieving, this was actually disappointing to Martin because he felt that the more exposure he was being given to the outside world that he was being jailed, the more coverage he could get for the Albany movement. On the 13th of July, Martin was released. But on the 27th of July, Martin was arrested again at a prayer vigil in front of the city hall. On the 10th of August, Martin's sentence was suspended and Martin decided that it would be best that he left Albany. Because violence was being used by both sides. Albany's chief of police beat a pregnant woman and in response, members of the black community started to use violence, throwing bottles and rocks. Upon reflection, Martin felt that one of the main reasons that the Albany demonstrations weren't as effective as they could have been was because it was just too vague and too ambitious. They hadn't been specific enough in their demands and tried to do everything at once rather than take precise steps. The Albany movement was an important lesson from Martin that he would learn from in his next civil rights campaign, Project C. In Birmingham, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth led the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights to demonstrate against the strict segregation system that upheld old Jim Crow laws. In response, Shuttlesworth's home and church were bombed, and he and his wife were also mobbed, beaten and stabbed. Martin and the SCLC agreed to help the Alabama Christian Movement and started Project C, C standing for confrontation, to fight for the desegregation of lunch counters, restrooms and water fountains through sit-ins and peaceful protests. Project C commenced in April 1963, where Martin and the SCLC met with members of the black community every night to teach them about non-violent resistance and peaceful protesting. He taught the protesters to march, sing, kneel and pray to disturb traffic, but not to use violence or shout in anger. At the start of April 1963, Project C started to protest through sit-ins at lunch counters and on the 6th of April, they marched onto City Hall. This progressed to kneelings at churches and sit-ins at the library. The Commissioner of Public Safety in Birmingham, Eugene Bull Connor, who wasn't actually supposed to be in power because he'd lost the recent election to Albert Bootwell, but he just refused to give up his position. He was trying to be non-violent as well because he was anticipating an order from the court telling them to stop demonstrations. And on the 12th of April, the court order did come for the protesters to halt demonstrations, but for the first time, Martin and the protesters decided to violate the order. They marched again and Martin was arrested and for the first time put into solitary confinement. This was a blow to Coretta. She had just given birth to their fourth child, Bernice, without Martin being there and now she was being delivered the news that he was now in prison. So Coretta immediately rang the now president, Kennedy, and a few minutes later his brother Robert phoned back and told her that he'd look into the situation at once. Martin was also really upset because he'd read a piece where white ministers in Birmingham wrote to Martin and denounced the protests. The ministers called the protesters extremists, criminals and anarchists, which understandably offended Martin. This was so upsetting to him that he felt the need to write a letter in response to the minister's criticism, which is very very long. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I'm sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. Martin was then visited by a Clarence Jones, a friend of Martin's, who told him that Harry Belafonte had paid for his bond by raising $50,000, ringing anyone and everyone that he knew 24-7, and he said, whatever else you need, I've got you. And on the 20th of April 1963, Martin was released on bond and immediately set to work on the next stage of Project C, getting the Birmingham students involved. Members of the SCLC started going to educational institutions to headhunt students, teaching them about the principle of nonviolence and the importance of them getting involved in Project C. Mainstream media criticised the movement, saying that they were exploiting young students, and to that Martin asks, if you care so much about these children being used by the movement, where were you when these same children are being abused and mistreated by the segregation system? 
children as young as eight wanted to take part and on the 2nd of May 1963 more than a thousand young people peacefully protested at 16th Street Baptist Church which would be known as the Children's Crusade and they were jailed for it. At one point about two and a half thousand people were in jail and a lot of them were young people. As more people were being sent to jail, Bull Connor quickly forgot about being non-violent and started ordering policemen to use clubs, police dogs and pressure hoses on children. Amidst the protests, Robert Kennedy, the US Attorney General, had sent two representatives to Birmingham to start negotiations. At first, they didn't go that well. It seemed like the opposition was just not going to agree to any kind of compromise. However, when they saw that the jails were so full that black protesters were still flooding the streets in solidarity, and probably because they saw that their continuous use of violence wasn't working, they quickly changed their tune and said, oh, I can't see why we can't come to an agreement. Both sides did end up agreeing somewhat and a 24-hour truce was called. Project C had also been of national significance as President Kennedy publicly gave his support for the negotiations taking place in Birmingham at a press conference. On the 10th of May 1963, an agreement was struck where lunch counters, restrooms, fitting rooms and water fountains would be desegregated. There would be efforts to ensure non-discrimination in the workplace, cooperation for jailed protesters and an open channel of communication between the black and white communities so that future protests could be prevented. This agreement did create a backlash coming from segregationists in Birmingham though. Martin's brother's home was bombed that night, as well as Martin's hotel room. However, Martin wasn't in his Birmingham hotel room, he was in Atlanta when the bombings took place. When the bombings became common knowledge, this did lead to violence where stones were thrown at the police, cars were damaged and fires started. Martin had to quickly return to Birmingham and urge residents to stay calm and not engage in violence. 1963 would be a historic year for the civil rights movement in the USA. On the 11th of June 1963, President Kennedy made a speech on live TV that supported the civil rights movement and integration at universities. President Kennedy also promised a civil rights bill and this speech led to the popular slogan Free in 63. A march was also organised called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and when Martin and Caressa arrived they found more than 200,000 people at Lincoln Memorial, the largest crowd that had ever gathered in Washington DC. People were chanting Martin's name and he came up to the podium and began arguably the most famous speech of his career. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. 1963 was also historic here because of the tragedy that took place. On the 15th of September 1963, four young black girls going to Sunday school at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham were killed from a dynamite blast. Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson and Cynthia Wesley. The dynamite had been planted by four men who had been waiting outside the church for churchgoers to go inside. It was only when the case was reopened in 1977, 14 years after the event, that one man was convicted Two other men were convicted in the early 2000s and the last man was never formally charged. Martin returned to Birmingham and was there to deliver the eulogies for three of the four children at their funerals. These children, unoffending, innocent and beautiful, were the victims of one of the most vicious, heinous crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. Yet they died nobly. They are the martyred heroines of a holy crusade for freedom and human dignity. Also, on the 22nd of November 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated, a man who Martin called the pride of the nation. Martin himself was really shaken up by Kennedy's assassination, saying to Coretta, this is what's going to happen to me also. I keep telling you this is a sick society. While President Kennedy himself was unable to be there to see the civil rights bill being passed, his successor, President Lyndon B. Johnson, declared his intention to continue his legacy and pass it as soon as possible. Martin himself was there when the Civil Rights Act passed on the 2nd of July 1964 at the White House, and he can be seen smiling in a picture as Johnson signed the piece of legislation. Afterwards, President Johnson turned around, shook Martin's hand and gave him the pen that he used to sign the act as a souvenir. 
Three months later, though, Martin was in hospital for exhaustion. There had been riots in northern parts of the US, and while Martin tried to preach principles of nonviolence and peaceful protesting in these cities, he was at times met with hostility. Because another figure had risen in the US civil rights movement, Malcolm X. Malcolm X didn't exactly preach nonviolence. In fact, he felt that Martin's strategy of using nonviolent resistance and trying to work with white people would be ineffective, and that not fighting back was leading to black protesters being subject to even more violence. Rather, Malcolm X preferred using self defence rather than nonviolent resistance. While Martin was recovering in hospital, he was woken up by a phone call from Coretta. He was half awake, bleary eyed, when Coretta said that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize. Martin was to be the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize at a mere 35 years old, and this was incredibly overwhelming for him. So Martin and Coretta went to Oslo in Norway to be officially awarded, and he donated the $54,000 prize money to the civil rights movement. Afterwards, Martin met with President Johnson specifically to talk about the unfair voting system in America that was skewed to unfairly prejudice black voters. However, President Johnson wasn't really on board with this idea. Martin wasn't going to be too easily defeated though. The next campaign for Martin and the SCLC would be in Selma, Alabama, where only 350 out of 15,000 African Americans were registered to vote. By now, Martin knew that there was a certain criteria that had to be fulfilled for a protest to be effective. One, peaceful protesters demonstrating in the streets. Two, racists resisting by unleashing violence on them. Three, the general reasonable members of the public say, look at the violence, the government needs to get involved and there needs to be legislation in place. And four, the government implements short-term measures to stop the protests and subsequent violence and then long-term measures through legislation. So, first of all, peaceful protests. In February 1965, Martin delivered a speech in front of hundreds of protesters and loads of reporters in downtown Selma, where Martin and the protesters were later arrested. At the rally, he said... If Negroes could vote, there would be no Jim Clarks. There would be no oppressive poverty directed against Negroes. Our children would not be crippled by segregated schools and the whole community might live together in harmony. While Martin was momentarily away from Alabama, protesters had been subject to police brutality. In Marion, Alabama, Jimmy Lee Jackson died after being shot by police while trying to protect his mother from being beaten by a police officer. So Martin was determined to be there at the next march, this time from Selma to Montgomery. Right before he was visited by Governor Collins, he said that he shouldn't go to the march. President Johnson was still committed to equality for everybody in the US. Martin replied with, instead of urging us not to march, you should urge the state troopers not to be brutal towards us if we do march, because we have got to march. And so Martin and the Alabama protesters won the legal right to march and they arrived in Montgomery on the 25th of March 1965. After the Alabama movement, Martin began the Chicago Freedom Movement, a campaign for socio-economic justice in Chicago. Martin felt the importance of really living and experiencing what life was like for a black person in Chicago and in the year of 1966 he lived and worked in Chicago. Coretta said that the apartment was in a dingy building that had no lights in the hall except for a single dim bulb at the head of the stairs. There were no locks on the front door, drunks came in and used the hallway as a public toilet, so it always smelled of urine. The old refrigerator didn't work, neither did the dilapidated gas stove. Martin had to pay $90 a month for this, while white tenants in another part of the neighbourhood paid $80 for much nicer places. Landlords and estate agents made excuses to black tenants who were trying to rent or buy homes in white neighbourhoods. During the peaceful protests, there was violence. Protesters had bottles and bricks thrown at them, they'd be beaten and people would shout white power at them. Operation Breadbasket also commenced, which was in essence, if you respect my dollar, you must respect my person, which involved certain boycotts of selected products, which led to successful negotiations with multiple consumer goods industries for fair hiring practices. According to Martin, the net results added up to approximately 800 new and upgraded jobs for Negro employees, worth a little over $7 million in new annual income for Negro families. The success in Chicago was also complemented by Martin's completion of his new book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, his fourth and last book on human rights. 
Martin was met with criticism, though, when he spoke out against the Vietnam War and urged the US to negotiate peace rather than bombing North Vietnam. People thought that Martin's sphere was civil rights and he didn't really have a place to talk about war. However, Martin stuck to his guns and delivered his first speech that spoke out against war in New York. Martin also met with President Johnson to explain his anti-war stance. On the 4th of December 1967, Martin launched the Poor People's Campaign to address the mass unemployment in the African-American community and felt that change at the federal level was needed, i.e. a $30 billion anti-poverty programme. Martin reflected, it required a Selma before the fundamental right to vote was written into the federal statutes. It took a Birmingham before the government moved to open doors of public accommodations to all human beings. What we now needed was a new kind of Selma or Birmingham to dramatise the economic plight of the Negro and compel the government to act. In Memphis, black sanitation workers were striking because of their inadequate working conditions and pay compared to their white colleagues. They contacted Martin to see if he could help in any way. Martin participated in a march in downtown Memphis, along with thousands of protesters on the 28th of March 1968, which quickly turned into a riot and led to violence. Dozens of people were injured and a 16-year-old died after being shot by police. Even though this march ended in circumstances that were far from ideal, Martin would not give up. Another march was planned for the 5th of April and Martin said there will be no violence this time. On the 3rd of April, Martin was due to address 2,000 protesters, but he said that he was too tired, maybe Ralph could speak instead. However, Ralph and Jesse Jackson persuaded him that he would be the best person to speak, and Martin ended up agreeing. So this would end up being Martin's final speech, the famous I've been to the mountaintop speech. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity, has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. On the 4th of April 1968, Martin and his colleagues had been planning for the march that would be scheduled the next day. He went back to his motel, the Lorraine Motel, and was stood on the balcony with Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson. James L. Ray, who had booked a hotel room with a clear view of Martin's balcony, aimed and shot Martin in the face. The bullet entered Martin's cheek, fractured his jaw, exited and re-entered Martin's body through the neck, It severed some vital arteries, went down and lodged itself into the lower part of his body and fractured his spine in multiple places. Martin was taken to the hospital but was pronounced dead on the 4th of April 1968 at 7.05pm at the age of 39. When Martin's assassination became national and global news, many riots took place in more than 100 cities. However, Memphis, where Martin had been planning the march, did not riot. Instead, Coretta, her three oldest children, and Ralph Abernathy, Martin's closest friend, led the march that Martin was planning to lead along with 19,000 people. At Martin's funeral, a tape was played where Martin talked about what he would want people to say about him at his funeral. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the walkway. Martin was buried near his grandmother, who he had loved dearly and had a profound impact on his life, and on his tombs read the words at the end of his I Have a Dream speech. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. And so ends the life of Martin Luther King Jr. But his legacy and his life's work on civil rights has lived on. Coretta, now Martin's widow, created the King Centre in 1968, which ended up being a memorial, museum, library and national historic site dedicated to Martin's life. At the time, there were talks of Martin being honoured with a national holiday, but it didn't really go anywhere. 
But in 1980, Coretta wrote to leaders and politicians across America to push for a national holiday in honour of Martin. And on the 3rd of November 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed the holiday bill into law. And in 1986, the first Martin Luther King Jr. Day was celebrated on the 18th of January and has been celebrated every year since then. However, Martin's dream of social, economic and racial equality in the US has not yet been fully realised in the present day, which is particularly evident from the Black Lives Matter movement. Today, in 2020, Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream is still not yet a reality. But that was the end of the fourth episode of the Loud Girl Talks History podcast. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, give it a like, subscribe, leave a review, and I'll see you on the next one.